Hi there, my highly valued, treasured and esteemed viewers and listeners, and welcome back to your channel of choice. My name is Dr. Nath Arwa. I am a clinical pharmacist by training and by profession, and I am the founder of Progressive Pharmacotherapy Consultants, premier virtual clinical pharmacy institute for capacity building for healthcare workers. The virtual clinical pharmacy institute with a difference where patient safety Medication therapy management and optimal clinical outcomes are very, very crucial and non-negotiable to us. Here, we seek to remain your premier source for crucial tips for high-impact pharmacotherapy services. So I humbly urge you to sit back and spare me part of your very precious time to share with you some very useful tips which may prove very, very handy in your line of duty. So I welcome you all to part 125 of our pharmacotherapy MCQ series, which measures in infectious diseases. Welcome. And question one reads, Mr. AWL, a 49 year old male patient presented to your hospital and informs the attending physician at the HIV comprehensive care clinic, he suspects he is HIV infected today he returns to the physician to initiate care for HIV infection. He has a past medical history of type 2 diabetes mellitus, hyperlipidemia, and GAD. His family history is non-contributory. His sexual history uh, tells you he's an MSM with a stable partner and he uses condoms most of the time. The partner is HIV negative. And this gentleman is not an IV drug abuser, he doesn't take alcohol, he doesn't use illicit drugs, and he has no known drug or food allergies. Currently, he takes etovastatin 20 mg at night, a gram of metformin after breakfast and after dinner, 20 mg of omeprazole once daily before food, and he takes 10 ml of antacids when necessary, pro renata, up to four times daily. Some of his pertinent labs uh, include values that are within normal limits. His HIV antigen and HIV antibody tests are positive. The HIV-1 stroke HIV-2 differentiation assay is positive for HIV-1. And the Western blot is indeterminate. And uh, the review of systems shows no active problems. A physical exam is done and it shows no abdominal, no abnormal findings. So an assessment and a plan is put in place. The physician plans to determine and establish Mr. AWL's HIV status and consider highly active antiretroviral therapy if he tests HIV positive, according to the notes. So my question to you is, which of the objective evidences listed below confirms Mr. AWL's diagnosis of HIV infection? Is it the HIV antigen antibody positivity and the HIV-1 stroke HIV-2 positivity? And uh, the fact that the Western blot is indeterminant, or is it the HIV antibody antigen positivity and the HIV-1 stroke HIV-2 test positivity? Or is it the HIV-1 stroke HIV-2 positivity alone? Or is it the HIV antigen stroke antibody positivity alone? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. B is the correct answer. HIV antigen stroke antibody positivity and HIV-1 stroke HIV-2 positivity. Now, according to the CDC guidelines on laboratory testing of the diagnostic diagnosis sorry, of HIV infection, uh, HIV infection is confirmed when both the HIV antigen antibody tests and the HIV-1 stroke HIV-2 differentiation assays 
are positive. That makes answers D and C incorrect, and it makes answer B the correct answer. Now, the Western blot test is no longer used for confirmatory testing of HIV, which makes answer A incorrect as well. Let's move to the next question. Your clinical team at the HIV Comprehensive Care Clinic has educated Mr. AWL about his HIV diagnosis and sent him to do several lab tests prior to the next clinic visit, which is scheduled in 14 days' time. 14 days later, the HIV consultant reviews Mr. AWL's results, which are as follows. HIV viral load is 70,000 copies per ml, the CD4 count is 510, the CBC and metabolic panels are within normal limits, the HBV and HCV and tuberculin skin tests and sexually transmitted disease infection testing are all negative, the HIV resistant testing is negative, and then the HLA B star 5701 testing is positive. So my question to you is, when would it be appropriate to initiate highly active antiretroviral therapy in Mr. AWL's case? Is it A, not until his viral load exceeds 100,000 copies per ml? Or is it B, not until his CD4 cell count drops below 500 cells per mm cubed? Or is it not until he has symptoms of HIV, or is it possible to do it today, if feasible? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. So today, if possible, would be the correct answer, and I'll tell you why. According to the current HIV treatment guidelines, all patients should be initiated on highly active antiretroviral therapy as soon as possible after the diagnosis of HIV. That makes answer D correct. And I would like to remind you that historically, guidelines suggested waiting to initiate therapy when the patient's CD4 cell count or the viral load reached a certain threshold or the patient became symptomatic. However, several investigations, including the what we call the START trial, S-T-A-R-T trial, have demonstrated that uh, there are both morbidity and mortality benefits associated with starting therapy earlier in HIV infection, if possible. That statement makes answers B, C and A incorrect. Let's move to the next question, please. And it reads, which of the highly active antiretroviral therapy regimens listed below would be the most appropriate for Mr. A. W. L.? Would you settle for darunavir, co-formulated or boosted with ritonavir alongside tenofovir, alafenamide, and emtricitabine? Or would you settle for bictegravir together with tenofovir, alafenamide, and emtricitabine? Or would you settle for dolutegravir, abacavir, and lamuvudine? Or would you settle for efavirenz, emtricitabine, and tenofovir, disoproxyl fumarate? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct regimen. I would settle for B, Bictegravir, Tenofovir, Alafenamide, and Emtricitabine, and I'll tell you why. I would like to start by saying that efavirenz-containing antiretroviral therapy regimens are no longer recommended as first-line therapy in patients living with HIV 
due to concerns for poor tolerability. That makes answer D incorrect. Likewise, the Runavia containing regiments are not as well tolerated as uh, the integrase inhibitor based regiments and are no longer considered to be first line options in treatment naive patients. That makes answer A incorrect. I would like to add that uh, an abacavir containing regimen should not, and I repeat, should not be used in this patient's case because we are told his HLA B star 57 allele positive, the test turned positive. So answer C is incorrect as well. Now the remaining regimen is a recommended first time therapy. In the current treatment guidelines, and uh, in my opinion, it would be the best choice for this patient. I would choose to treat him with big tegravir, which is an INSTI, alongside enofovir alafenamide and m Let's move to the next question, please. And it reads, regarding Mr. A. W. L.'s HIV therapy. Which of the combinations listed below should be administered separately due to potential drug-drug interactions with serious implications for the patient? Would it be dolutegravir and aluminum containing antacids taken PRN? Or would it be LVtegravir co-formulated with cobicistat and atovastatin 20 mg taken at night or would it be dolutegravir and metformin 1, milli, 1 gram twice daily or would it be raltegravir and omeprazole 20 mg once daily i'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer So A would be the correct answer, dolutegravir and the antacids taken PRN. I would like to emphasize that there are no clinically relevant drug-drug interactions between raltegravir and omeprazole, which makes answer D incorrect. I would like to add that dolutegravir can potentially interact with metformin and uh, increased monitoring for glycemic control and metformin side effects may be necessary if the two are co-administered. Uh, similarly, lv co-formulated with cobicistat can interact with atovastatin and atovastatin dosing should not exceed 20 milligrams. And then I would just like to add that for both of these interactions, separating administrations from dolutegravir will not reduce the likelihood or severity of uh, the interactions and that makes answers b and c wrong conversely uh, due to potential collision interaction separating the administration of dolutegravir from aluminum containing antacids will be necessary to avoid treatment failure and that makes answer a the correct choice let's move to the next question please And it reads, when would it be ideal to measure Mr. AWL's next viral load? Would it be in a year's time, in six months' time, in three months' time, or in one month's time? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. I would measure it in one month's time. Now, according to current guidelines, viral load monitoring should occur between two to eight weeks following the initiation of highly active antiretroviral therapy. And that makes answer D the correct answer and makes answers A, B, and C incorrect. Let's move to the next question, please. And it reads, Mr. AWL reports to the HIV Comprehensive Care Clinic 
for a follow-up visit 90 days later. He informs the HIV consultant and the nurse he is tolerating his highly active antiretroviral therapy regimen well. He has been fully adherent. And uh, the pertinent labs on that day show an HIV viral load of below 50 copies per ml and his CD4 count is 555 cells per mm cubed. Uh, so my question to you is, is an influenza vaccine indicated in Mr. AWL's case? Is the answer yes, because all patients with HIV should receive influenza vaccine? Or is it B, yes, but only because his viral load is undetectable? Or is it C, yes, but only because his CD4 count is over 500 cells per mm cubed? Or is it D, yes, but only because his CD4 count is over 200 cells per mm cubed? I'll give you 10 seconds to ponder over the best choice. So in my opinion, A is the correct answer. Yes, because all patients with HIV should receive the influenza vaccine. I would like to emphasize that according to the ACIP recommendations, all patients with HIV should receive an inactivated influenza vaccine regardless of the CD cell count or the viral load. That makes answer A correct and answers B, C and D incorrect. Let's move to the next question, please. And the next question reads, today, Mr. AWL returns to the HIV Comprehensive Care Clinic 180 days after initiation of his highly active antiretroviral therapy in the company of his sexual partner. They inform the HIV consultant they have been in a monogamous relationship for the past 36 months. His partner has tested for HIV every year. All the tests have been negative. The last one was performed 180 days ago. Mr. AWL's partner doesn't take any medications. He completed an antibiotic course for a cold 30 days ago. Basing on the CDC PrEP guidelines, is Mr. AWL's partner at substantial risk of acquiring HIV? Is the correct answer no, because he is in a monogamous relationship with an HIV-infected person? Or is it B, no, because he has sex with an HIV-infected person who has an undetectable viral load? Or is it C, no, because he has sex with an HIV-infected person who is on highly active antiretroviral therapy? Or is it yes, because he has sex with an HIV infected person. I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. In my opinion, this partner is at a risk Answer D is correct. It says yes because he has sex with an HIV infected person. I'd like to start by saying that the CDC PrEP guidelines provide criteria to help clinicians identify patients who are at substantial risk of HIV infection. Now, because uh, AWL's partner is a man who has sex with uh, other men, uh, he has 
and he has HIV infection, the partner is at substantial risk of acquiring HIV, which makes answer A correct. Now, even if the partner is in a monogamous relationship and uh, is on heart with an undetectable viral load, the partner remains at risk of acquiring HIV infection according to the current guidelines and should be considered for pre-exposure prophylaxis PrEP. So that makes answers A, B, and C incorrect. The next question reads, after 14 days, uh, Mr. AWL's partner presents to the HIV Comprehensive Care Clinic to discuss his lab results with the likelihood of being initiated on pre-exposure prophylaxis. He and Mr. AWL have abstained from sexual intercourse for the past 14 days. He had a cold when his HIV antigen test was done, which could be indicative of an HIV flare-up. Some of his labs include a fourth generation HIV antigen antibody test is negative. It is highly reassuring that this result was negative around the time he experienced his cold-like symptoms. His H hepatitis B test is negative and his renal function is normal. Basing on the CDC PrEP guidelines, what medication regimen would you initiate in AWL's partner? Would you settle for tenofovir alafenamide, TAF, and emtricitabine administered daily? Or would you settle for tenofovir disoproxyl fumarate, TDF, and emtricitabine administered before and after high-risk sex? Or would you settle for tenofovir disoproxyl fumarate, TDF, and emtricitabine administered daily? Or would you settle for TDF administered daily? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. I would settle for tenofovir disoproxyl fumarate and emtricitabine administered on a daily basis. According to the CDC pre-exposure prophylaxis guidelines, the medication regimen that is recommended is TDF and emtricitabine administered on a daily basis. That makes answer C the correct answer. I would like to add that tenofovir monotherapy has been investigated but is not current recommended that makes answer d incorrect and i would like to add that event driven pre-exposure prophylaxis has also been studied heavily and is an endorsed treatment option in several international guidelines however the cdc guidelines do not yet endorse this approach to pre-exposure prophylaxis so that makes answer b incorrect it should be a daily regimen and not occasionally before and after high risk sex. Then I would like to add that tenofovir alafenamide is currently under investigation as a potential option for pre exposure prophylaxis, but is not yet recommended in the current CDC guidelines, which makes answer A incorrect as well. Let's move to the next question, please. And it reads, how often should Mr. AWL's partner be tested for HIV after initiation of pre-exposure prophylaxis? Should it be every 12 months, every 6 months, every 3 months, or on a monthly basis? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. The 
It should be every three months. At a minimum, the CDC guidelines recommend testing persons receiving pre-exposure prophylaxis every three months. So that makes C the correct answer. Then answers A, B, and D are all incorrect. Let's move to the next question, please. And it reads, after three consecutive years of care at your HIV comprehensive care clinic, being consistently virologically suppressed on highly active antiretroviral therapy, Mr. AWL is lost to follow up. Unfortunately, today he presents to your HIV comprehensive care clinic with a chief complaint of cough lasting seven days with mucoid sputum, low-grade fever, progressive breathlessness, and he isn't on highly active antiretroviral therapy at the moment. Neither is he taking any other opportunistic infection medications. He stopped taking them 12 months ago after being fired by his previous employer. Currently, he is jobless and he has no insurance cover, so he can't afford procure his heart. On physical examination, findings consistent with the advanced HIV and probable pneumonia uh, are ascertained. Mr. AWL is admitted to a general medical ward and his x-ray and bronchoscopy findings are consistent with the PJP. His arterial blood gases show the following, a pH of 7.37, a PaO2 of 68, a PCO2 of 20, an SaO2 of 90%. And some of his pertinent labs include a viral load of 220,000 copies per ml. His CD4 count is below 38 cells per mm cubed. His CBC and metabolic panels are within normal limits. HBV and HCV and STI testings are all negative, fortunately. And the, the HLA B star 5701 testing is positive. So my question to you is, which of the cotrimoxazole regimens listed below would be the most appropriate for Mr. AWL's management now now. Would you opt for a cortimoxazole weight-based dosing administered IV and divided every eight hours with adjunctive corticosteroids? Or would you do a cortimoxazole weight-based dosing administered IV and divided every eight hours alone? Or would you settle for a cortimoxazole weight-based dosing administered orally and divided every eight hours with adjunctive corticosteroids? Or would you settle for cortimoxazole 2DS tablets orally every eight hours? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. A is the correct answer. I will do weight-based dosing of septin cortimoxazole administered IV in three divided doses, that is every eight hours with adjunctive corticosteroids. Now, given Mr. AWL's severity of illness due to the PJP as demonstrated by his PAO2, which is below 70 millimeters of mercury, he should receive weight-based IV cortimoxazole, TDS, that is every eight hours, in addition to corticosteroids. That makes answer A the correct answer. Now, oral therapy or intravenous therapy without addition of corticosteroids would provide suboptimal therapy according to the current opportunistic infection treatment guidelines, and that makes answers B, C, and D incorrect. 
let's move to the next question please and it reads for which of the opportunistic infections listed below does mr a w l require antimicrobial prophylaxis is it cryptococcal meningitis and cmv retinitis or is it disseminated mac and toxoplasmosis encephalitis or is it toxoplasmosis encephalitis and cryptococcal meningitis or is it d oropharyngeal candidiasis and cmv retinitis i'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer So B is the correct answer. It's for disseminated MAC and toxoplasmosis encephalitis. I would like to start by commenting that uh, with the CD4 cell count below 50 m per cells per mm cubed, Mr. AWL will require prophylaxis against both MAC and toxoplasmosis, which makes answer B the correct one. I would like to remind you that Mr. AWL may also be at a risk of oropharyngeal candidiasis, cryptococcal meningitis, CMV retinitis, but prophylaxis is not routinely recommended for patients with HIV infection at risk of these pathogens or infections, which makes answers A, C, and D incorrect. Let's move to the next question, please. And it reads, the clinical team decides to reinitiate Mr. AWL on highly active antiretroviral therapy. So my question to you is, when would it be appropriate to reinitiate this highly active antiretroviral therapy regimen? Would it be when the patient is discharged from hospital? Or would it be when the pneumocystis treatment is completed? Or would it be within two weeks after pneumocystis diagnosis? Or would it be before pneumocystis treatment is started? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. So C is the correct answer. It would be within two weeks after the pneumocystis diagnosis. I would like to start by saying that for PJP, a mortality benefit has been demonstrated when patients are initiated on antiretroviral therapy within two weeks after initiating PJP treatment, as opposed to waiting to such therapy uh, four or more weeks later. So that makes answer C the correct one, and answers B and A are incorrect. I would like to add that uh, there is no clear benefit to initiating antiretroviral therapy prior to initiating treatment for PJP, which makes answer D incorrect. Let's move to the next question, please. And it reads, Mr. AWL has markedly improved on PJP treatment. He has been reinitiated on highly active antiretroviral therapy. Today, the clinical team has discharged him with plans to follow him up at the infectious diseases clinic in seven days' time. So my question to you is, which of the following is the most common type of medication error at the time of transition of care for hospitalized patients with HIV infection? Is it resistance to ART? Is it side effects with ART or heart? Is it allergies to heart? Or is it medication errors with heart? 
I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. D is the correct answer. Medication errors with highly active antiretroviral therapy. Now, medication errors are common among patients living with HIV infection, especially those encountering transitions of care. The most common errors are those that involve providers ordering incorrect antiretroviral therapy regimens, that is wrong drug, incomplete regimen, for example, and that makes uh, answer D correct, and I consider answers B, C, and A incorrect. Let's move to the next question, please. And it reads, Mr. K.H.R., a 47-year-old male patient, was diagnosed with HIV five years ago and was initiated on a tripler, which is a favorence co-formulated with the m and denofovir lisoproxyl fumarate. He is virologically suppressed. He has ongoing struggles with dizziness and uh, abnormal or vivid dreams and chronic depression. He requests the HIV consultant at your HIV uh, comprehensive care clinic for a regimen switch. And he informs the clinician he takes no other medication and he has no history of HIV drug resistance. Some of his pertinent labs are a CD4 cell count of 550 cells per mm cubed. His HIV-1 RNA is uh, below 50 copies per ml. And uh, he is HLA-B star 57 O1 allele negative and the CBC renal function and liver function tests are within normal limits and he is HBV immune and is HCV negative so my question to you is which of the reasons listed below would be the most compelling reason to switch Mr. KHR's heart regimen Would it be A, effervidence is associated with a risk of suicidality, or would it be B, he is at a risk for kidney injury from TDF, or is it C, an integrase inhibitor-based regimen would be more effective, or is it D, a protease inhibitor-based regimen would lower his risk of developing HIV resistance? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. So I consider A the correct answer. If evidence is associated with a risk of suicidality. I'd like to start by saying that a meta-analysis -anal of four large clinical trials found an independent association between effervidence and suicidality. Uh, the association was particularly present in those with an underlying mental health condition, including depression. As a result, the most compelling reason to switch this patient's regimen would be the presence of a chronic depression and the association between effervidence and suicidality, which makes answer A correct. Now, while PI-based regimens do have a higher barrier to HIV resistance, this patient has an undetectable HIV viral load on effervidence. And therefore, yeah, I consider him not to be at risk for developing HIV resistance. And that makes answer uh, D incorrect. And I would like to add that an integrase inhibitor or integrase inhibitors for, for that matter 
are very effective, but uh, the patient has evidence of virologic efficacy while receiving effervescence for the past five years and will not receive any additional efficacy benefits from an integrase inhibitor. That makes ANS um, C incorrect. Lastly, the patient has been receiving tenofovir for many years, five years to be specific, and does not have any evidence of kidney injury. Now, in the long term, he may find renal benefits from switching to TAF, tenofovir alafenamide, but uh, this is not a more compelling reason to switch his antiretroviral therapy at this time in comparison to his mental health and that makes ANS um, B incorrect. So there you have it my highly esteemed viewers and listeners that brings us to the end of this video. If this video benefited you in any way I would like to humbly remind you to give it a thumbs up, to like it, and to share it widely with your peers, and to leave your comments at the bottom of it. And if you haven't yet done so, I would like to humbly urge you to subscribe to my YouTube channel. I would like to promise you all that the very, very best is yet to come, and I thank you very much for viewing this video and for listening to me. I sincerely appreciate your partnership, your continued support, and your very kind collaboration. I look forward to interacting with you in part 126 of our pharmacotherapy MCQ series. Thank you very much.